love watching golf, talking golf, and most importantly, playing golf. Uh, if you don't yet, follow us on Instagram and Twitch to keep up to date with what we're doing. It is a Monday today. We know we, we know we normally do Sunday nights at 8 p.m., but since the golf went late and it was Father's Day, we decided to push it to Monday so we could recap the whole golf tournament. And I'm really glad we did because it was a, an awesome ending. Uh, so that was awesome. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers out there. Um, you know, normally we have the U.S. Open on, on the Sunday and, and Father's Day, but we luckily we had great golf. Um, Chaco, how you doing, man? Good, good, good. Actually down in North Carolina right now, it's open, um, but still an awesome finish at RBC. Yeah, uh, definitely a bummer. It was great to see some Brooks highlights thrown in there. Um, with with obviously his recent performances, but um, overall we got great golf and, and a lot of young guns uh, in there as well as some as some vets. So it really had uh, everything we want would want in a, in a championship. Yeah, for sure. I thought the you know a couple rain delays here and there pushed things back, um, kind of interrupted with the flow of the tournament. But I think. From a player perspective, um, content perspective, um, they really did a good job like putting on a, an awesome week, given the circumstances. Absolutely, and we're going to get to all that later during the tee sheet, but before we do, I wanted to really just uh, talk to you about how North Carolina is going. Uh, I know you've been playing some good golf down there, so, so talk to us about that. Yeah, so I am down here visiting my sister and brother-in-law, and um, they live right by duck country club um and i knowingly i booked a tea time there um it's like a semi-private course very very nice um and i went out early in the morning showed up at like 7 30 i played alone there was like nobody playing that early so they're like yeah the course is yours just fly around which was nice got some music going really had a good time just whipped around 18 in like three hours like didn't wait on anyone it was perfect conditions were nice we got like an inch of rain before uh, like the night before so it was a little soggy um but didn't really play that well mm -hmm. to be honest and they had like a nice range there pr practice facility. So I was, I like went to the range after it was like to, to work on some things. I was hitting it right. I was hitting it left all day on the left side of the range, just hitting balls. And all of a sudden the head pro comes like walking down the driving range. And I was like a little worried that uh, I wasn't going to be able to like, wasn't allowed to be like hitting balls after the round. Yeah. I, I really I didn't know the protocol. So he like comes up to me and introduces me introduces himself and i was like oh hi like i'm alex checo i you know i'm a guest here uh, my brother and sister-in-law live down the street and he's like oh welcome like glad to have you so he's hitting balls i'm hitting balls like not really striping it that well trying to work on some th swing thoughts and he literally comes up to me and goes hey you know i've been looking at a couple of your swings you know if you put your hands if you just raise them like and he literally he points at something in my swing. He's like, put your hands right there at the top of your swing and then follow through. I did it. I kid you not, the next like 20 shots, I just hit so pure. And I'm like, oh my God. Like, it's crazy that these guys can point out one small thing that can make such a huge impact on your golf swing. It, it's, it's literally insane. That's awesome. Uh, what a, that's, that's really cool also that he kind of came out and was just hitting balls and then was like, willing to go out of his way to help you out, you know? I feel like some guys would never do that, uh, but what a cool move by him. Yeah, super nice guy. He was, he, And then, like, after he was looking at my swing, he, like, went down, and he had, like, his uh, iPad uh -huh. out, and he was, like, videotaping some of the other members' swings um, and, like, giving them some advice. Um, but these guys just know so much about the game and, like, so many different swing thoughts and swing feelings, feelings yeah. that – you know, if you kind of replicate that and and think about it when you're swinging the golf club, it like it's crazy how much better you can mm -hmm. hit the ball. Yeah, wow, that's a, that's an awesome story. And hopefully, next time you go out and play, uh, you can keep that feeling because I know sometimes it is a little harder yeah. to take a break. Totally awesome. Well, let's move into the bladed wedge tee sheet. Uh, obviously, we had the RBC Heritage this weekend at Harbor Town uh, Golf Links in Hilton Head, South Carolina. Huge purse. The tournament was rescheduled from April 16th to the 19th to, to this weekend. Great field out there. There was 114 players who had won on the PGA Tour before. Um, but before we get to the actual golf, let's talk about Nick Watney and, and testing positive for COVID. Um, obviously, the PGA Tour 
didn't want this to happen, but it seemed like they did a decent job of identifying it and getting him off the course. I know he did go to the to the practice range after he took his test, um, but it, it sounded like he was pretty much social distance during that whole time. Um, but what were your takeaways from you know the first COVID interaction on the tour? Well, I think it was bound to yeah. happen, right? Like there were like they had to anticipate at least one guy getting it. Like I, I know Pat Perez said on the like four play podcast, he was like, I can't believe you know there's four hundred and fifty people traveling from tournament to tournament. Like I, I can't believe not one person has got it. Mm-hmm. So it finally happened. Um, I think the way they have to move forward is just trying to mitigate the risk. There's gonna be other people who get it. Um, if they start to see the numbers like increase, like, you know, from one to five to 10 to 15, then I think they have a problem. But I think if they can kind of put their plan in place that they had set for this and and kind of mitigate some of the risk of it spreading, then uh, they should be good to go and continue playing. I don't think they need to stop just because of one case. No, I agree with that. Uh, the one thing I think they could probably work on is establishing a little better protocol for once the player takes the test and what they do until they get the test result back. Um, it sounded yeah. like there might have been some issues with that, but uh, there wasn't many details that came out about it. The one thing that was interesting is that he was wearing a whoop, which is the, the device that you see in a lot of players, and that helped him identify a couple, uh, you know, numbers that were off and he wasn't feeling well and that's why he went and took the test. So just an interesting point there. Uh, But, you know, what's going to be really shocking is if this happens to a guy in contention. You know, a guy who's in top five, top ten, going into Sunday and test positive Sunday morning. That would be a a pretty big deal and potentially a game changer for a tournament and a a lot of money on the line as well. Yeah, but I think they have to. They, in that case, they would have to cancel it, or they would have to put that person in Absolutely. isolation. That's a that's the protocol. They can't they can't move to a different circumstance just because that guy that person is in contention. Totally agreed with that. Um, you gotta you have to have that person leave the tournament. It would just be a huge, you know, potentially it could be a smaller guy who's playing really well and this could be a huge first tour card or just for his bankroll in general it, it could just have huge ramifications and then moving on yeah. you know it was a it was a really good golf tournament a lot of you know birdies made eagles made throughout the week there was a, people going low from thursday to sunday but, but headed into sunday there was 15 golfers within two shots which is one of the most crowded tournaments i i've can remember mm. in terms of guys who have a chance to win. Um, you know, Sunday, uh, a couple guys went low, like Brooks and JT. Um, but once the, the rain delay restarted, it really turned into a uh, answer versus Hatton. And they were battling it out, playing really good golf. Uh, and, and for the whole front nine and, and the start of the back nine, it really seemed, and, and the TV coverage was following them, uh, it seemed like it was going to come down to them and, and who could, you know, make the last birdie really because of, of how well they were both playing. But then, uh, as you guys saw, Webb Simpson out of nowhere made five birdies on his last seven, just had one of the hottest putters I've seen. Um, you know, he's obviously got a, a swing that, that gets it around the course and he was hitting some good shots, but the guy made everything he looked at on, on the back nine Sunday. And that's how you go from whatever he was tied third to, to winning the tournament. Yeah. I mean, he just couldn't miss. Yeah. And I think he's sneaky good around those Carolina courses. Mm-hmm. Um, but just in general, I had no idea he was the ninth ranked player in the world. Like he's such a sneaky top 10 golfer. Um, that you don't even realize, you know, he's, you know, won the players championship. He won the 2010 U S open at, at Olympic field, which is like one of the hardest U S open venues ever played. Um, so no surprise that he, he did win, but, um, he kind of has this like sneaky, really good type of golfer mentality where you don't really realize how good he is until he's actually out there playing. Absolutely. I think part of it is he just looks like a, a pretty normal dude. He doesn't have like yeah. a beautiful swing. He doesn't hit the ball the farthest on the BJ Tour, but the guy gets it around. And they were talking about a pretty interesting story about how he struggled with his putting, and then he went to the um, the the anchored like belly putter um, and was using mm. that and, and won a couple big tournaments and was a really good golfer. And when they outlawed that, that really threw him off. 
and now he's gone yep. to the claw with the putter resting on his forearm, similar to what Bryson or Kuchar does, and that's really allowed him to get his mojo back in the greens. Um, so I thought that was yep. a cool story, and you know, obviously brings up the debate uh, around, hey, should that even be legal, um, which is a, a conversation for another day, but it, it's obviously within the rules now, and, and he's, he's taken full advantage of it. Yep, definitely. Um, anything else that, that really stood out to you about the tournament? I know, you know, it was obviously beautiful that that, that came across on the television, but uh, fans didn't seem to, to affect that. There was more this week than there was last week, and I, I'm not really sure why that was, but just kind of a point there. Yeah, I think also, too, like, you know, we're, we're catching a lot of hot mics, mm-hmm. uh, th- like, in these events with, you know, limited fans. Um, it, it's kind of funny to see. I, I know, um, you know, there. it's not the best uh, language being displayed, but it's kind of, I always chuckle when I hear, like, someone drop the F-bomb when they hit, like, a bad, like, I know, like, Rory had, like, a bad F-bomb um, the one day, which was kind of yeah, funny to see. absolutely hilarious. Makes him a lot more relatable, you know. I can see you doing that or me doing that out there for sure. Um, and they're, you know, kind of going back to Webb Simpson, him and his caddy obviously have a really good relationship. So uh, having them uh, on the mic for a lot of those shots, especially the three wood he hit on Saturday over the trees, uh, was awesome. Where his caddy was basically, maybe it was a five wood, but his caddy was convincing him to, to go for it. And he just hit an absolute yeah. beautiful shot. So that dialogue that we've been talking about for five weeks now between the player and the caddy at the moment of decision is still, you know, so interesting to hear. Yeah, definitely. And then moving on to next week. So we have the Travelers Championship uh, at TPC River Highlands in Cromwell, Connecticut. Another big prize, you know, another pretty stacked field. Um, so I'm very excited to, to watch golf again this weekend. Um, but, you know, the big thing that we've been talking about is, is Tiger Watch. No Tiger again this week. Really starting to look like he won't come back in, until mid-July for the Memorial. But have you heard anything that would make you feel different? Yeah, I think at this point he's just holding off to the Memorial. Mm-hmm. Um, like, we, I don't think we'll see him. I don't know why. I mean, I saw him playing, like, Frederick Golf Course in Georgia with his son and like doing some practice down there, but I I think he's just holding off for now um, and kind of like teasing us mm-hmm. about like where he's going to play. Like, I don't know why in the world his yacht was parked at like right outside Hilton Head, like probably the, the, the least common place that he could have been at that specific time. Um, so, I mean, I guess we see him when I see him, but to, to I mean to the rest of the PGA Tour's defense, I mean the golf has still been great. Yeah. You know, I don't necessarily miss like seeing Tiger Woods out there. We love him there, but don't miss it. Absolutely, um, you know the the yacht the yacht movement made me seem like he might have thought about playing there and then just decided not to. You know, it is Tiger is getting older, has young kids, so Father's Day. This is probably the first Father's Day he spent yeah. with his kids, maybe until he's his kind of in his injuries that kept him out of a u.s open so that could have been kind of a, a special day for him but uh like you said probably looking for memorial now it would be really weird to watch tiger without a crowd i think that would be the moment where i where i would notice the crowd not being there yeah no i agree but it's different like on tv like i just don't see it that uh-huh. much i don't it, it doesn't really register in my head that there aren't fans um, unless like one of the announcers like comments that there isn't fans. It, does, it just isn't a huge like distraction for me watching the golf. Absolutely. Um, so that's going to be exciting this weekend. Obviously, we'll recap it next Sunday at 8 p.m. So stay tuned for that. Moving on to our rotating topic. We are doing Would You Rather play Augusta for the rest of your life, but that's the only course you could play, or just go play every other course and never play Augusta. Um, so I'll let you kick this one off, Jekko. Definitely, I would rather play other courses. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just so many awesome places to play golf in this world that not being able to experience them would just be 
tragic in in my opinion i i'm gonna have to agree with you on that one but i think it's a little bit closer for me you know i would have to get if that was the only golf course i could play i would definitely have to get a house down there and and just play it all the time i think if i could bring also bring my friends to augusta whenever i wanted that might be a little bit more enticing to choose that option but I'm in total agreement with you that there's so many good courses yep. out here, out in the world. There's so many historic courses outside of Augusta that I have played or, or want to play going forward that it would be hard to give that up, as well as just convenience. Mm-hmm. You know, when when I, when you're home or when you're somewhere else, it, it'd be it's nice to go out yep. for a quick 18. So I think we're in agreement there, but it's a little bit harder for me. Yeah, no, I, I definitely get that. And then before we get to the interview, like we say every week, we're still looking for help. Um, so if you want to be our third, help us out on social or video editing, shoot us an email um, on bladedwedge at gmail.com. Give us a follow on Twitch and Instagram. And as again, as a reminder, next week, 8 p.m. on twitch.tv slash bladedwedge. Uh, to finish today's episode, we have our interview with Alyssa Kesar. You can find her at New Lady Golfer on Instagram. We previously recorded this, but it, she really has been uh, an interesting story where she's shared her journey from being a beginner golfer to you know where she's at now. Um, you know, pretty formidable golfer. She plays a lot of really cool courses down in the San Diego region, um, and she has uh, an involvement with the Farmers Insurance Open, which we, we dig into. Uh, with her during our interview. So enjoy the interview, and we'll see you guys next week. Later. Hey, guys. Today we're with Alyssa Kesar. Super excited um, to have her on. We've been a big fan of her Instagram page, New Lady Golfer, for a while. Um, And she was one of our um, kind of first followers and and really, you know, one of our most uh, passionate ones. So we really enjoy having her on, and we really like the content that she posts as well. So definitely check her page out. But how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm so excited to be on your guys' podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, we're super excited to have you as well. Um, And, you know, if you guys have seen her account or if you want to check it out now, it's super interesting. And it kind of goes through uh, her journey to from us getting into golf and, and kind of starting her fan page at a similar amount of time and then kind of growing the page as she kind of got better and better into golf. So, just kind of starting at the basics, you know, why did you uh, want to get into golf in the first place? Uh, so I moved to California just under two years ago from New Jersey. Um, I grew up an athlete my whole life. Mm-hmm. I played soccer. Um, in high school, I played soccer in college. And then um, once I moved here, I realized that the weather's always perfect. <laughs> and a lot of people like to be outdoors. I like the active, healthy lifestyle. And I was kind of looking for my next sport. And uh, a lot of people around here, like a lot of my friends, were into golf. So I'm like, you know what? I think I want to learn to play so I can get out there with everybody. That's awesome. So you basically realize that moving from the East Coast to California gets you way better weather, uh, (laughs) which is something that Alex and I haven't learned yet. So we'll be taking notes on that. Um, Yeah. But, you know, can you talk about, you know, obviously it's a pretty daunting task to take on golf, um, especially at the start. So, you know, kind of what really helped you, you know, practice and, and improve um, from, from really starting as almost a complete beginner, right? Yeah, complete. I had never played before. Um, but, yeah, so if I knew then what I knew, like I knew what I was getting myself into, uh, my decision might have been a little bit different. <laughs> uh. <laughs> but no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I... I really like the challenge and I'm pretty competitive. Um, So what I did right from the beginning was I started taking lessons. Uh There's a place, a range around here called Stadium Golf, and they offered monthly, like monthly classes, almost like a gym membership. So they would offer classes every day, small groups, and then they would teach you all the aspects of the game, full swing, putting, getting out of the bunker. They would teach you the rules, some etiquette stuff. So I had a really good foundation start there I was practicing going to the classes almost every morning and then um and then I started working with a coach a little over a year ago his name is Mike Maggs based out of Carlsbad at the Southern California Golf Academy Mm -hmm. so then I went to that one-on-one to get that really individualized instruction so between the start getting those basic fundamentals in that group class and then transitioning into the one-on-one coaching has really made a difference in my game I'm just about to be so the end of I'm sorry, like the beginning of July will be about two years. That's awesome. I feel like that's a really good thing for someone else who's really p- picking up the game to start off in that group lesson, 
really kind of learn with people of the same skill level, you know, really learn uh, some of the fundamentals. And then, you know, once you kind of have that down, you know a little bit more you're doing, then maybe investing in the one-on-one -on -one makes a lot of sense. So I think that's yeah. some pretty good advice to give a, a lot of people. Um, and that's cool that you were able to find a lot of those programs um, because I know, um, you know, that's probably something that's more needed in golf in terms of getting beginners in there. Um, yeah. For because sure. Like it's, you, like, it's really intimidating to yeah. go out on a course if you don't know how to really swing a club, especially being a female mm -hmm. or just a beginner golfer in general. It can be a little bit intimidating. Uh, but that that would be my best suggestion for anybody who really wants to try to like learn to play golf would be to seek out instruction right from the beginning. I mean, even myself, I had no basis, like no fundamentals, and I still developed bad habits. Uh -huh. So I couldn't imagine if I learned the wrong way from the beginning and then had to try to go back and relearn the right way. So instead, I got the, some really good coaching and fundamentals like as a blank canvas, mm -hmm. and I think that that was really instrumental in um, making a lot of progress early on. That's awesome. I think, you know, just kind of a, a bigger takeaway than that in, in more of the golf world developing easier programs for you know P, you know i feel like they've done a really good job with people under 18 but maybe people over 18 being able to take lessons like that or going on the course in a more safer setting it's a very intimidating sport and i think the more we can move it to more of a fun beginners welcome the the more the game will grow so i totally agree there um yeah and then you shifted from um, kind of becoming a beginner in golf to having a position within the Farmers Insurance 2020 event. So yeah. how did that role come about and how did you get started with that? Yeah, so I think it all sort of started really with my Instagram. It, it wasn't like when I started documenting like beginner golfer stuff that I really had this grand plan in mm -hmm. mind. But I did know exactly, like we, I came up with a strategy and then I knew I wanted to stay very focused, almost like, you know, stay in my lane and not try to do too many different things and play to what my strengths were going on a platform like Instagram. So I was just keeping it very golf centric, just sort of help, wanting to be more inviting for people to come and start learning the game. And also people that have been playing for a really long time were there side, like on my side sort of cheering me on and mm -hmm. encouraging me. And it was just really nice. It was, it helped me be more excited about learning that I had people supporting me and cheering me on. And then, um, you know, so I don't know if you guys know, the Century Club of San Diego is the nonprofit organization that runs the farmers. They are the ones that do all the behind the scenes work yep. and put it all together. Uh, so one day I actually got a direct message from a guy who is the current president of the Century Club. His name is Tim Young. And he's like, hey, I really love your content. I like what you're doing. Would you be interested in meeting me for a lunch meeting. And again, I hadn't been in San Diego that long. I did go to the farmers in 2019, but I didn't really know, you know, ever. I just thought it was not, not a golf tournament. Right. <laughs> uh, so, so I had talked to a few people and they're like, oh, the Century Club runs the farmers. Like you should probably take that meeting. So I was like, okay, great. So we met for a lunch and he wanted to know more about my story and how I got into learning golf and sort of what I was doing on social media. And then he explained to me that, the farmer, the Century Club and the farmers, they were looking to position the event as more of a lifestyle event, like opening day at the races we have mm. here in Del Mar and, um, and sort of position it as a lifestyle event to attract a larger crowd instead of just being very golf centered because they're, they knew that they were already going to get the people who love golf, who know all the players, who have been playing for a really long time. And those people were already going to attend the farmers. They wanted to reach that lifestyle crowd that loves to get out in the California sunshine, be by the beach, walk around, socialize, be with friends, um, you know, maybe do a little bit of day drinking because uh -huh. there's so much of that, uh, you know, offered on the course. And then, yeah, there's going to be some golf and Tiger Woods is going to be playing and on the hole behind you. And like, so he explained their goal to me and then said, we like what you're doing and we'd like to get in that influencer world to get that word out, get that message out about the event. And that was where I came in and the role of social media host was sort of born from that whole idea. That is awesome. I think, you know, That's honestly, awesome. some really good strategy from, from his perspective to identify that as like a perspective avenue for growing golf. And I think, you know, we've seen 
some success around things like that with the waste management. You know, obviously on a little bit more of a of a rowdy level, but similar aspects of making it more fun. Hey, this is a social event. Come come day drink, come socialize, come enjoy yourself in the sun because you know that's really what golf is to a lot of people. Yeah, and you know, I give a lot of credit to the Century Club team. I worked very closely with their CEO Marty Gorsuch and then their um, the girl who runs their marketing, Ashley Adams, and they all got it. Mm -hmm. They were all able to get on board and see sort of that vision and how things were going, which is not always easy to do when things are always done one type of way, especially with the PGA Tour. It can be risky sometimes to try to do something different. Um, so they were also you know, on board, and I worked very closely with them, and, and we, had a, we had a lot of fun doing it. And I, I'm pretty sure that this year had like record sales and um, – it was a really, it was a great time. It was an incredible experience from my perspective as well. Looking back at the experience, was there a favorite part during the week that you like really loved doing? Um, you know, I really, growing up being an athlete, I really enjoy being a part of a team mm -hmm. and I was able to see all of the work behind the scenes work that was being done and how hard everybody was working and all the hours and weekends and just the complete sacrifice of time to make this event as special as it was. So it was really cool for me to see all the buildup. I probably worked for, you no, know, probably five months leading up to the tournament with the team. So then to see it all come to fruition and see it all play out mm -hmm. was pretty incredible. It was pretty incredible. So um, other than that, I think just I had like all access and I ha had to just like sit back and pinch myself because I could literally go inside the putting green. Well, I like walked right, Tiger Woods walked right by me one morning and I was just like kind of a surreal moment for me. And just being around the pros, I got to play in the pro-am. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that was an incredible experience. I was so nervous. I was just like, do I even, I can't even believe I'm getting to do this stuff. Um, and just, just being a part of this incredible PGA tour event and getting to, see and do the things I got to do the entire week was just, you know, it was surreal. <laughs> That's awesome. And I think, you know, one thing that you, you mentioned is just like the five months of work leading up is you really forget, you know, on TV how much goes into each of those tournaments and, you know, people spend, you know, the whole year even getting ready for the next year. So, uh, yes. you know, there's the, the tournament organizers and the sponsors and, and getting the ticketing and all that stuff is, is a huge process and four days go by and then it's, Next year, which is crazy. Yeah, exactly. The Century Club team, like, I, it's pretty amazing. I think there's like 12 or 14, it could be off plus mm -hmm. or minus two um, employees, but it's like a very small team that does all of that work. It was incredible to see. I was, it blew my mind. Like, they were amazing to work with. Like, they, it's, I just, it's hard to talk about because I just saw all, how much time and energy and effort and all the work that they did with such a small group of people. That's awesome. And especially having Tiger, it be one of Tiger's events that he's always kicking off his PGA Tour start with. I'm sure there's added attention that goes into that as well. Oh, for sure. Um, there was so much, like, as the players start to commit, they have almost up until, you know, pretty close to the tournament to say whether or not they're going to be yeah. attending and you know, every of course everybody's like waiting waiting to hear about tiger <laughs> uh we were pretty sure we thought that he was going to but you never know until you get that final word so once he committed that yeah there was a lot of attention paid especially because he's trying to break the record so of yeah. course every tournament is sitting there like let it be us yeah. let it be us so um that was a very exciting once you got to see like the really big names start committing that they were going to be there you know it's always a great thing and Tiger Woods is just in a category. He gets like his own category when it comes to that stuff. Awesome. And yeah. I even, um, so back in March, I was actually out in San Diego with my family vacation and I was able to play Torrey Pines with my dad and just walking around that course was just spectacular. I mean, it's yeah. just such a beautiful venue to hold and to, especially the history of, you know, having Tiger Woods versus Rocco Media in that 2008 U S open um, you know, walking around that course is just breathtaking. Yeah. Did you play north or south? I played south, yeah. which was, yeah, the more, I guess that's the U.S. Open venue, correct? It yeah. is, and that's where they play the Saturday, Sunday of the Tory, the Tory Pines. So what was your favorite hole? Um, I really liked, 
the the par three that overlooks the cliffs. I think yeah. it's like it's on the front nine. It's the yeah, third it's hole. The yeah, third hole. Yeah. I thought that was awesome because yeah. we played it in the morning, so it was like there was a bunch of fog um, and like it was right out over the water. Oh, it was just unreal. Yeah, it's incredible. I feel so lucky to get to play it as often as I do. It's a public course. Yep. I mm-hmm. mean. For if you're a resident, you can play at Twilight for like thirty five dollars or thirty eight dollars. Yep. I mean, how do you how do you not go play that course? That's so awesome. Cheaper? Yeah, it's crazy, yeah. right? Yeah. It's even during even during the day, like regular hours, it's only like sixty three or sixty eight. I mean, it's a little different if you're coming from out of town, which uh-huh. I'm sure like, you know. Yeah. But uh, if you're a resident, you can play it for so cheap. It's it's hard not to want to go and play it all the time. That's Absolutely. awesome. So, uh, you know, before we do get to the rapid fire questions, uh, the, the last question I kind of wanted to leave you on is, you know, obviously you, you've had some success both in your personal game as well as growing your Instagram account and getting more involved. Where are you looking to really take, you know, not only your golf game but also your personal brand kind of going forward? Um, so I put in a lot of effort. To, I just want to be the best social golfer that I can be uh-huh. so I can get out there and I can – compete and sort of hold my own really with anybody uh and then after the farmer the farmer's open opportunity was a pretty pivotal time for me um very grateful for that opportunity and i'm looking forward to doing that again for the 2021 Uh farmers open and that sort of opened up a little bit uh, of a nice avenue for me as far as hosting opportunities so i've been doing some stuff with golf life which is a monthly show that airs on different channels all across the entire country. So this weekend will be my second hosting debut with that. Well, I guess not debut anymore, but my second hosting uh, opportunity with them. So I'm really excited about that. And I'm just looking to do, I love the media side of things. I love the networking and I like the hosting Mm -hmm. and I like doing all the different things on social media, all the different content creation. I like working with the different golf courses to, um, promote their promote their side of things as well and then ultimately i still like to call it's weird people sometimes i think don't view me as a beginner anymore but i am 100 percent still very new to the game uh and i'm learning day by day and honing my my game but ultimately i want to continue to be um that person that keeps breaking down the barriers Mm -hmm. wants to be like inspire more people to want to join the game of golf, males, females. Uh, and I just want to help keep it growing that in that regard and showcase it as a fun social sport and try to break down those barriers of the, the intimidation factor and, um, you know, just keep having, like, having fun. Yeah. I think, you know, the authenticity that you have of like, hey, you know, like, I'm still a beginner and I'm still learning. Like, I think, you know, that is, like, really appealing to people. I think, you know, everyone on Instagram is, like, I'm the expert, you know, like, follow me. I'm going to teach you how to do this. But I think, like, the authenticity of is really refreshing from my perspective. So that's one of the reasons why I really like you, you know. I think we'll head to, to rapid questions now. So, Treko, you want to take those away? Absolutely. All right. So, uh, four questions. Uh, number one, do you, who is your favorite PGA or LPGA professional? Oh my gosh. Um, I feel like it would be so like, easy to say Tiger Woods, uh-huh. <laughs> but he's just amazing. Like he's so amazing and his comeback and what he's been able to do and just being I- iconic for the sport of golf is just amazing. So I have to give him credit there. And, um, and I also, I also think that Rory McIlroy swing, especially his driver, like mm-hmm. his drive yep. swing is amazing yeah. like if i could probably pick any drive swing to have it would be his agreed <laughs> and i think he played in the farmer's insurance this year right yeah he did yeah. yeah so it was cool to be able to see it really up close and personal yeah. same thing with tiger woods awesome what's your favorite uh, course you've ever played okay well i played a ton in San Diego. i haven't played much north of san diego but I love Torrey Pines. I, I love Torrey Pines. Uh-huh. It's like my second home. Um, also locally in San Diego, I love Coronado, which is another public course. I don't know why. Just It's very golfer friendly, and I always have a great time when I play there. And then 
a private club that I get to play a lot in San Diego is Santa Luz Country Club. And that's also like another second home for me. So I really love playing. And then, sorry, I guess I'm saying too many, but yeah, I also good. love a new course I played in San Diego is Madeiras. Um, beautiful. It's semi-private, but it's also, you can get on there too without a membership. And it's just, it's a beautiful course. It's one of my newer favorites. Sounds like we need to make a trip to San Diego, Tucko. That oh, sounds like some great sure. golf. Well, I hear uh, Phil Mickelson plays a lot at San Diego Country Club, which is oh, also... Yeah. I haven't played there yet, but I heard that's beautiful. And then I know, I think he plays a bit up at the um, the Grand Golf Club at the Grand Del Mar. That's really nice, too. Man, I could... <laughs> a lot of good courses. It's hard for me to pick just one. <laughs> so moving into the next question, what is your favorite club in the bag, in your bag? Like, what's your best club that you hit? Oh, okay. So it kind of depends, and it's always changing. Um, but as of late, um, my three wood and I have become very good friends. And also my putter. Ooh. I've been practicing a lot. Once the golf course is closed down, I practice a ton. I have my perfect practice little putting training aid right behind me. Uh -huh. um, I, so I use it all the time, and my putting has gotten so much better, and it's actually lowered my score, like a handful of strokes. So I'm a believer in practicing short game. hundred <laughs> percent. I completely yeah. agree with that. Yeah. And then this is a good segue into the final question. What's your lowest round you've ever posted or shot? It so it actually just happened not that long ago. I shot an 86 at oh. Madera. So that's probably Congrats. Awesome. I'm that's awesome. starting to really like that course because I play well. I've played well wow. both times. I've, I've gone there. Uh, so yeah, 86 is my lowest ever. And then... My lowest ever at Torrey Pines on the South Course, I just recently broke 90 there and I shot an 89, which that course was always getting me. It was like so hard for me to even break a, like 100 there at times. And then um, like two weeks or just a couple weeks ago, I finally broke 90 there. So I was like, oh, that is awesome. super impressive. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So that's all we got. Great. So really appreciate you coming on today. Keep up the awesome work and we'll keep following and supporting you. Um, and we will talk soon. Okay, great. Thank you so much, guys. I really enjoyed this. Thanks so much.